Make sure to use code BANGLE at sign up on FanDuel for a $20 deposit bonus. And check out my second channel for other games coming up like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Call of Duty Black Ops 4. As well as my third channel with collaborations with some of your favorite YouTubers. Let's get into the video. What's going on guys? Bangle again here coming back at you with another video for another off-season plan. Of course, we are going in draft order, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss your favorite team. And today we're going to be doing the San Francisco 49ers. This was a team that obviously did not perform well this past season. They won just four games after their aspirations were of going to the playoffs and, and maybe being successful in the playoffs. You had Jimmy Garoppolo. You won six games last year, but it looked better down the stretch. Jimmy Garoppolo was on a five-game win streak, undefeated as a starter. Things were looking up for the one-win 49ers. And then, tragedy struck early in the season of 2018. I hope you understand when I say one win 49ers. I mean, when they acquired Jimmy Garoppolo to winning five straight at the end of the season to finishing six and ten. But then tragedy struck when Jimmy Garoppolo went down early, refused to go out of bounds for God knows what reason, tried to force his way back, you know, towards the middle of the field, which was weird, and then tore his ACL. Absolutely terrible luck for the 49ers. Although, to be fair, Jimmy Garoppolo should have been a bit smarter. The Vikings started out by beating the 49ers in week one, but then the 49ers bounced back with a win against the Lions. They only lost by uh, 11 to the Juggernaut Chiefs, lost by two to the Chargers, by 10 to the Cardinals, who of course are the worst team in the NFL, and then only lost by three to the Packers. But without Jimmy Garoppolo, they really, really struggled down the line. Didn't help that their defense wasn't too great anyway. So we have a lot to do with this 49ers team. Sure, it's going to be great that Jimmy Garoppolo is coming back. And I don't want to discredit what Nick Mullins did because he was actually pretty solid as a starter. I think if anything, their defense let them down because they didn't keep him in games. But on the same token, on the same note, this is a 49ers team that really struggled to put up points in some games. Obviously against the Bears defense, it's one of the top in the NFL. So maybe only scoring nine with Nick Mullins is acceptable. Scored 32 against the Rams in the final game of the season. That game is, is nothing. The Rams sat a bunch of their starters. Doesn't really matter. But when you're only scoring like 26 points uh, as like one of your season highs, that's not fantastic. They crushed the Raiders 34-3, but 23 points against the terrible Giants defense. That is a pretty bad loss. 16 against the Seahawks. 23 against the Seahawks again in a game that went to overtime. 20 against the Broncos, 10 against the Rams, 18 against the Cardinals. This is the team that really struggled to put up points. Only went above 30 uh, with Nick Mullins, I believe, twice. If that, 34 against the Raiders, and then 30 against the Packers. Yeah, so this is just this is just not a team. And that was with C.J. Beathard against the Packers. Excuse me, Mullins took over, uh, I believe, in the following week against the Rams, maybe? Regardless, it might have been C.J. Beathard as well. But that's overall is the offense. It doesn't matter if it was C.J. Beathard at quarterback. It doesn't matter if it was Nick Mullins because Jimmy Garoppolo is their starting quarterback. He is the team leader, the guy that led them to all of their success in the previous season. We need to address the defensive side of the ball. We need to bring back some playmakers. We need to make a lot of offseason changes. I know there's a big prelude, but bear with me. Here's who you're going to re-sign. I need to see Mark Inzocha back. He's a Pro Bowl special teamer that played a lot of linebacker. And even if he's not going to be your starting linebacker, he's a Pro Bowl caliber special teamer. So I think you absolutely need to hit bring him back. Elijah Lee is a restricted free agent. And what that means is that the 49ers are free to match any offer that Elijah Lee gets on the open market. And they can bring him back uh, as the first priority team. Kyle Nelson, you always need a long snapper. And then I wouldn't mind the 49ers bringing back a very good special teams unit of Robbie Gold and Bradley Pinion. I'm also going to have the 49ers cut Pierre Garçon. This would be pretty beneficial to free up cap space. This is a guy that's very injury prone, can't stay on the field, and honestly has underproduced in his time with the 49ers. I think it's time to cut your losses in more ways than one. Move on from Pierre Garçon. Save yourself some money down the line. It's only $7 mil in dead cap this year. Not really too big of a deal when you're already not paying guys that much anyway as a whole compared to the rest of the league. I don't want to see Jimmy Ward re-signed. I think he was kind of a waste of a first-round pick. 
as was Joshua Garnett. That was obviously a different management group. Now, of course, you have, uh, hopefully soon to be, Hall of Fame safety John Lynch as the general manager. We'll see if he can be a Hall of Fame general manager. Well, <laughs> that'll be very interesting, but I don't want to see Jimmy Ward resigned. He's underperformed. He's not worth his contract. I think he might fetch more on the open market than he's actually worth. So I don't think the 49ers should resign him. I think it's a good move to let him go. Another notable name I don't want back is Alfred Morris. There's just no need for him. You sign Jarek McKinnon to a massive deal, and he's probably not even going to be your starting running back because you also have Matt Breida. I imagine it'll be a running back by committee sort of situation. I remember when the Giants had two backs that went over 1,000 yards with Derek Ward and Brandon Jacobs. That was an interesting situation, and a bunch of teams have done running back by committee, and they've done so very successfully. You look at the Saints most recently with Alvin Kamara and Mark Ingram. I think the 49ers can do something very similar with that with Matt Breida, who is a beast, and Jarek McKinnon, who was one of the unsung heroes of the NFL for a while with the Minnesota Vikings. Very good player, but overpaid. But he's a good player nonetheless. Should be a very good one-two combo, one-two punch in San Fran. In free agency, we're going to start off by signing Danny Shelton, a nose tackle. Now, I know what you might be thinking. The 49ers are pretty good on the inside. They don't need defensive line help. Well, Danny Shelton's a player that could come pretty cheap. He's a former top pick of the Browns. I believe he was the middle of the first round. And he's a good player. He is effectively a nose tackle, though. He's going to be in on running downs exclusively. He's going to rotate in and off the field. And I know you have DeForest Buckner. He's an absolute beast. He can stuff the run and really is a fantastic interior pass rusher. Solomon Thomas is someone that moved inside and was most successful there, but again, kind of more of a pass rusher. And then Eric Armstead moved inside a lot as well. He was at great 3-4 defensive end for the 49ers. And again, kind of a run stuffer, has some pass rush ability. Not really a fantastic player, but he's decent enough. You really need a fantastic run stuffer. I think it would help out the 49ers significantly. Obviously, edge is a huge area of concern, but you have the second pick in the draft. You can effectively take whoever you want. And we'll get to that a little bit later with Edge. So I don't really think they go Edge in free agency. I'm going to go Danny Shelton here, nose tackle. Uh, obviously, they might sign a rotational Edge player. But uh, we're not going to make it a huge area of need in terms of signing one of the top Edge rushers available. I don't think Clowney hits the open market. So Danny Shelton, nose tackle, gets a very, very good run stuffer on the 49ers team. Helps him out pretty significantly. With this next signing, we're going to go ahead and give the San Francisco 49ers Kareem Jackson formerly of the Houston Texans. He had his best year ever this past season. Kareem Jackson was spectacular. I know he wasn't great in the playoff game against the Colts, and he is 30 years old. He's going to be turning 31 in April, so he will be 31 at the start of next year. But he's finally coming into his prime. He was a guy that was taken pretty high out of Alabama, was the 20th overall pick of the 2010 draft, and has never really come into his own until very recently. He had a fantastic year this past year with the Texans, rated very, very well on Pro Football Focus. Not that that's the end-all, be-all, but he was a very solid player uh, nonetheless. He played on the outside as a cornerback, but I think he did most of his work in the slot as the slot cornerback for the, or nickel cornerback for the Houston Texans. He was very, very good. They played a lot of dime as well, and Kareem Jackson was so perfect in that slot cornerback role arguably the best year of his career and even though he is 30 turning 31 I think a three-year deal for Kareem Jackson would work really really well he excels in zone coverage and what do you run most in San Francisco the defensive quarter uh, coordinator Robert Sala is pretty much a zone exclusive defensive coordinator which means you need to get better zone personnel around the 49ers you need to get better zone players on the team obviously Richard Sherman is very good on that one side but I don't have a ton of faith in Akella Witherspoon. I'm looking for scheme fits here. And I think as a nickel cornerback, dime cornerback, you know, playing that slot role can also move to the outside when necessary. Kareem Jackson would be a perfect fit on this 49ers team. And the last signing we're going to do is uh, bringing back Micah Potty. He was such a good player with the 49ers and he's been all right with the Cardinals, probably entering what might be the twilight of his career and he's still like a fine age I think for an offensive lineman he's 31 you could easily get two three four years of uh 
of good production from him. And the offensive line is something I think the 49ers need to improve. And why not bring a player that was so fantastic with you for, for years? He was so good with the 49ers. Four-time Pro Bowler with them from, from 2012. And then he was a 2015 Pro Bowler one year uh, with the Cardinals. So three-time Pro Bowler with the 49ers. But he's been, you know, your best offensive guard that you've had in the past 10 plus years. I can't say offensive line in general because, I mean, Joe Staley's been so fantastic for that team. But bring back Micah Potty. Recreate that magic. He's still fine. He's a free agent. Bring him back. This is a perfect fit in my mind. Works great for both sides. Now moving on into the draft. We're going to have the 49ers taking Nick Bosa at number two. And you got to wonder, hey, isn't Nick Bosa going number one overall? Well, not in the scenario that the Cardinals trade back from number one. I think there's a large chance that that ends up happening. And you have so many teams in need of a quarterback. So many guys that could view Dwayne Haskins as their franchise guy that just that one piece away from going deep in the playoffs. Maybe the Broncos would have that mindset. Maybe the Giants. Maybe the Jaguars. The Redskins were all set to win the division before Alex Smith went down. What does a potential franchise quarterback do for one of those teams? Would they be willing to give up picks in order to move up to number one? I think yes, and I think the Cardinals will absolutely do that. This is not a Cardinals video, though. We talked about the Cardinals yesterday. You can feel free to watch that video. That will be on my channel, or it is on my channel as you see this. So that means a quarterback goes number one overall. The 49ers are thrilled because arguably the best player in the entire draft falls to them at number two. This is great value, which sounds crazy to say. How is it fantastic value for a player at number two? Well, Nick Bosa was arguably more dominant than his brother Joey at Ohio State. He was absolutely fantastic. Pure edge rusher. Fantastic edge bender. Has a litany of pass rush moves. Is effective in stuffing the run. In three games this past year, had four sacks, six tackles for loss. In 2017, eight and a half sacks. 16 tackles for loss, playing against top-level Big Ten offensive line. He was absolutely fantastic. His speed, his burst off the edge, is number one player in the draft caliber. And the 49ers, who have a weak edge rush combo in Solomon Thomas, who does most of his work on the inside, and then we're talking about what? Ronald Blair, Cassius Marsh, Cass Cassius, that's a tough word for me to say for some reason, tough name. But Nick Bosa turns around this 49ers team. We've seen what the 49ers can do when they drafted sick edge rushers in the past. You look at Alden Smith as a prime example. Add another great pass rusher. This one with significantly less off the field issues than Alden Smith, who walked into LAX and said, I have a bomb. I hope Nick Bosa is not going to be doing anything explosive like that off the field. Hopefully all on the field. Fantastic pick at number two here for the 49ers. And I think this is a likelihood. If I'm doing a mock draft with trades, if I had to make and put money on who I think is going number two to the 49ers, this would be my guy. I would go Nick Bosa. I think that's almost a lock. In round two, I have a player that you may not be familiar with, and that is Nasir Adderley, a safety out of Delaware. So, all right. I know what you're thinking off the bat, maybe if you haven't heard of this guy. Uh, he is an FCS player, a little bit not impressive as far as the other top talent with schools that are out there. Maybe if Deontay Thompson's on the board, that's the guy that you look for. But this is going to be a draft riser. When I ran across his tape within the past week, I have been getting to two, uh, two safeties. I've loved what I've seen from Deontay Thompson at times, hated it at other times, like the national championship. And uh, I like Jonathan Abram quite a lot at the Mississippi State. But Nasir Adderley is one of these guys that you cannot ignore. Fantastic range. And just because he comes from a small-time school, you can't, you can't teach that speed and say that he doesn't have that top speed because his speed is great. It's that range. His coverage ability is incredible. He's a guy that's not scared to come up and make a hit, and he fits so perfectly with this 49ers team. He's a guy that was recruited, I believe, as a cornerback, so he's a versatile player. Maybe Kareem Jackson plays on the outside. You have Nasir Adderley, Adderley at times play that slot cornerback role. But really, he's going to find most of his success over the top as a single high safety with tremendous range. Now, I wouldn't compare him flat out to Earl Thomas because I view him a little bit on a pedestal. But it's that type of a player that has that sideline to sideline range 
very good speed. His ball skills are the best of any defensive back in the class by far. Some of his plays that you'll see um, when you watch a highlight tape of him or throw on the game side. But I would suggest highlights with Nasir Adderley to really view those ball skills more so. Uh, because I'm telling you, out of the tape that I've seen, he played against some top FCS schools that you'd be familiar with, like North Dakota State. I mean, you can't teach that kind of coverage ability. His coverage is fantastic. Again, the range is, is one of the best of any safety in this class, if not the best. So don't let the fact that he comes from an FCS school of Delaware scare you away, because this is a real top talent. And I think he's going to come up really high in the draft. Would not be shocked to see him go high in the second round. Maybe sneak into the first, but we have him here in the second to the Niners, who fill a very, very big need. In round three, Kelvin Harmon wide receiver out of NC State. Kelvin Harmon is a good player. I like Kelvin Harmon. I do. I see some people thinking that he could go in the first round, and I don't think that's impossible. There are a lot of receivers in this class. It's kind of difficult to view, you know, who's going to kind of rise to the top more so than others. Harmon has, you know, prototypical size. Six foot three, 215 pounds. Last season at NC State, he was fantastic. Caught 81 passes for about 1,200 yards and 7 touchdowns. The year before that, 69 catches. Nice, over 1,000 yards, 4 touchdowns. But this is a pure yardage guy. Has a real, real ability to make you miss after he gets the ball in his hands. And that size is elite size. 49ers need more weapons. If you cut Pierre Garçon, which I think is a likelihood to save a lot of money down the line for the 49ers, Kelvin Harmon would be a very big weapon. A true number one. I like Trent Taylor as a slot receiver. I like Marquise Goodwin as a speed deep threat, someone that can also probably play the slot. Kendrick Bourne was okay. Kelvin Harmon could offer a true number one target for Jimmy Garoppolo, and you need to provide him with something else. You need to provide him with some more. I know George Kittle's there, obviously, but at wide receiver, you need a real threat, and Kelvin Harmon in the third round could very well provide that and start in his first year. In the fourth round, I'm going to go Julian Love, cornerback out of Notre Dame. Some people are really high on Julian Love. I don't think he even comes close to the first round. Others are less high on him. I think he's solid. I think his value is probably anywhere from the third to the fifth. So the fourth really seems like a natural fit here. He's a good player. Um, I think a little bit overhyped just because he's playing at Notre Dame. And I mean, it has a large fan base and large national uh, viewership. He's decent. I don't think anything special, so sorry to get your hopes up, but I think he does excel in zone coverage, and when you look at a team that runs as much zone as the 49ers do, I would say probably upwards of 75% of the time they're running zone, and uh, I, I, you know, I, don't fact check me on that, but they run zone a lot when you watch them play, so Julian Love would fit that zone system, probably wouldn't be a guy that starts uh, at least in year one for the 49ers, maybe if injury, but with Kareem Jackson, Akella Witherspoon, Richard Sherman, he would be probably the fourth or the fifth cornerback on that squad. But nevertheless, a position with uh, high potential here. Round six, we're going to go Joe Deneen, a linebacker out of Kansas. Solid inside linebacker. Uh, has a ton of tackles, but he plays in the Big 12. He doesn't really have elite speed. Uh, but a solid, strong tackler. Probably a guy that's going to have an impact on special teams more so than anything else. But I like the pick here for the 49ers. Could rotate in at times, and I think you will see him do that with whatever team that he goes to if he gets drafted. But definitely a guy that's going to make an impact on special teams. He will make an NFL roster, I would guess. So Joe Deneen here out of Kansas is going to finish this draft here. Let's go ahead and see how these players would fit onto the new-look San Francisco 49ers. Starting with the offense, as per the series so far, I have the new players or the players that did not play very much or at the end of the season due to injury or what have you uh, in pink and without a grade. So that's going to be Marquise Goodwin on the outside. I think Dante Pettis can also play the outside, and they can rotate in and out with uh, with Marquise Goodwin. So Pettis, Goodwin, Trent Taylor, Kendrick Bourne maybe. I didn't talk about Pettis when I mentioned the receivers a little bit earlier, but clearly here he is. He was a really big impact player for the 49ers before he went down. So I think a wide receiver trio of Marquise Goodwin, Dante Pettis, Kelvin Harmon is a really, really solid group for Jimmy Garoppolo to throw to. You see he's in there, a quarterback as well. Matt Breida wasn't listed as a back. Another injury-prone player, but Jarek McKinnon is kind of going to take the load off him a little, a little bit. So if you have McKinnon, Breida, 
Good one-two punch at running back. We talked a little bit about that earlier. And then Goodwin Pettis Harmon at receiver with Trent Taylor rotating in, with Kendrick Bourne rotating in. That's a pretty good group of five. And then, of course, Mike Iupati at right guard or left guard. You could switch Lake and Tomlinson if you'd like. Uh, but Iupati is, you know, a versatile player. He can play left or right guard, I think, with relative ease. So that is the new look offense. And it looked pretty good, man. I mean, Lake and Tomlinson isn't fantastic. And he's not even that bad. He's average right now. He's worked up to that. Western Richburg, his grade looks pretty terrible via pro football focus, but he's a pretty solid starting center. He was pretty good with the Giants. Not exceptional, but pretty good. Concussions are a concern for him, but overall a pretty solid offensive lineman. So this line, I think, got a lot better just with the addition of Mikey Yapati and players progressing. Joe Staley's obviously fantastic. Mike McGlinchey had a fantastic rookie year at right tackle. And then you have George Kittle. You could say easily top five tight end in football now, and then revamp receiving core to some degree uh, with your you know your players coming back, being healthy, Kelvin Harmon adding. I think it's a pretty good offense. And then on the defensive side of the ball, this one has had a lot of work done to it. This would be their base 4-3 defense with Fred Warner, of course, re-signed Elijah Lee. I think it's a decent group of linebackers, nothing special. Fred Warner's pretty good. He had a solid rookie campaign. Can't take anything away from him there. And then Solomon Thomas probably would stay on the edge, rotate inside. I think you're going to see the 49ers look to get another, at least rotational edge player. Could be at some point in the draft, could be in free agency. Didn't have it here. And then you're going to have Solomon Thomas, Eric Armstead, DeForest Buckner kind of rotate in. Maybe you rush five. Nick Bosa coming off the edge is elite talent. That is fantastic. Maybe that's going to give Solomon Thomas fewer double teams more opportunity to get one-on-ones and get after the quarterback. So I think that's going to be a lot better of a situation for him. Kareem Jackson obviously slots into that slot cornerback role. Fits really, really well. It's where he's seen a lot of success. And then a Keller Witherspoon on the outside with Richard Sherman at the other CB spot on an island is probably what you're going to want to see. Jaquiski Tart coming back healthy is fantastic. You're also going to see Adrian Colbert probably rotate in. But Nasir Adderley is at single high safety. Jaquiski Tart in the box. Another guy that can come down as well with Nasir Adderley, a slot cornerback in some packages. Kareem Jackson can play free safety. It's a really interesting group of players. I like what Nasir Adderley brings to them. I think it gives them a lot of speed in the secondary, something that they lacked previously. And I think it's a much better team. I really do. This is a team that can compete in the NFC West. I think it'd be one of the better NFC West teams. Although I'm going to have to say that about a lot of these teams because basically I'm building them and I can do whatever I want. Um, but this is, I think, a realistic off-season preview for the San Francisco 49ers. And I want to thank you guys so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you in the next one. Take it easy.